Welcome back, everyone, to Neighbors in the Network. I'm James Pineda, your host. Today, I'm joined by a very special guest, Elizabeth McGuigan, the Senior Vice President at the Philanthropy Roundtable. Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks, James. It's great to be with you. I appreciate that. Well, your background is so varied and so rich, and we could we could talk for a long time about what you're up to now, but I wanted to start in the past. I wanted to hear about your story. So tell me a little bit, how, how did you grow up and how did that shape your your current trajectory? Sure. Well, I grew up in Connecticut where um, you know, I rebelled against my teacher union mother and social worker father by becoming involved in things like Young Republicans and Young Americans Foundation and George W.'s first campaign. Um, so I'd always been interested in politics and uh, having a family environment where debating was encouraged um, was really uh, formative for me. So I knew I wanted to go to college in D.C. So I was paying my own way, and I ended up at a very liberal women's college in the district called Trinity College, offered me a great scholarship, it was a wonderful experience, and it certainly tested the, my debate skills every single day, every single class was challenged. Um, and I mean, when I say liberal, this is where Nancy Pelosi went. This is where Kathleen Sebelius went, another illustrious progressive women. But it was also where Kellyanne Conway had gone to school. And that really opened a door for me as well. So I did my first internship with her firm at the time, the Poland Company. And that helped set me on my future career path. And I learned a ton from her and from her team. And it also led to several other internships, including the last one I had before I graduated with Americans for Tax Reform where I ended up working after graduation. Wonderful. What was it about politics that caught your eye at a young age? You know, it's interesting. I think because my family had always really encouraged spirited debate. Yeah. Um, once I realized their politics, it was very easy to just pick the other side and um, be the, you know, the top free market, limited government advocate in our, on our dinner table. Was, was it a good uh, nature or did people start to get heated when, when you were? Mix of both, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it was definitely seen as a, as a rebellion, but supported. And yeah, my, my family is very supportive. So it's it's always been a fun experience. But yeah, politics was, was great. And I knew that D.C. was where I wanted to be. I suppose that probably shaped, you know, going to D.C. and then going to a very liberal college. Were you comfortable always having the unpopular opinion? Yeah, I was, because that's sort of how I grew up. So I was yeah. comfortable with that in college. And then, um, you know, I think that is what really led me to working in the liberty movement in general. Um, it was, you know, seeing the value of ideas and having pressure tested them over the years, over different, um, with different audiences, really got me into where I am today. Yeah, you know, that's kind of a blessing, actually, when you think about it. You, your bad ideas were probably torn apart really early. Like, you didn't have that parent who's like, oh, yeah, that's great. That's, I, I totally, you're, put it up on the refrigerator. <laughs> that wasn't that ex your experience. It is true. Yeah. I like it. Okay, so you were interning, and uh, I think you, you ended up, wound it up at Americans for Tax Reform. Um, and then what take me from there to where you're at now? Sure. Well, while I was working at ATR, I was doing, I started out doing state government affairs work. Um, and I was also in the economics PhD program at George Mason at part-time after I graduated college. I wanted to be an econ professor and um, I loved my classes there. You know, I was lucky enough to have courses with some of the great minds like Tyler Cowen and the late Walter Williams. Um, but as much as I liked the coursework, being in a larger uh, academic institution made me see that I didn't actually want to be an academic. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, I was really enjoying the work I was doing at ATR. You know, I was so energized by its limited government mission and by Grover Norquist as a leader and a coalition builder. So I saw pretty quickly that my day job was actually where I wanted to be. So dropped out of PhD school. I got an MPP from George Washington University, which was far closer to the office. Um, and I stayed at ATR for a few years. But this was during the, the W. Bush administration. It was such a fun time to be in DC, um, working with limited government allies, including the growing network of SPN think tanks. Uh, and it really showed me the power of ideas and, and coalitions in actually making changes to our government and to broader society. 
And then more generally, something that's carried with me today from that time is that I really saw for the first time the power of the volunteer and what families and communities could accomplish without the strong arm of government. So that was really um, what kind of solidified my my career path was my time at ATR. Mm, that makes sense. So a lot of questions then. What was it about econ that attracted you originally? You know, I, I just think free markets and the market economy in general is, is fascinating. And it was a really great way to sort of explain the world around me um, in a really compelling way. And those are skills I use still today. I mean, they certainly serve me well in, in fiscal policy and tax policy. Um, but it's also about behavior, about human behavior and about mm -hmm. why we do what we do and how we operate in a world of scarcity. You know, what is important? Like what wh what motivates people? What what keeps them up at night? That sort of thing. Like what are the most important things that we think about, right? Right, right. Huh. I can see that. I can see that. If I was if I uh, if I <laughs> I was a film student and a communications oh. student and things like that. So I was coming at it from a completely different area, but I can totally see there's still that same. So what's the most important things? How do we connect with people? It's Absolutely. kind of the same mutual path there. It is. What, what about academia turned you off, though? You said it was a really fun time in D.C., but you also mentioned you saw that academia wasn't for you. What was it? What was it about academia? Sure. You know, I think going from a small institution like Trinity to a large academic research institution like George Mason, I mean, it was exciting in a lot of ways, but it also ex it exposed the bureaucracy of mm. academia that I hadn't seen firsthand in my uh, small you know, liberal arts college. And um, a lot about that was was uninteresting. Mm -hmm. You know, I had I had interned at Department of Labor and saw really quickly I was not interested in working for a large bureaucracy, and um, the daily grind of the paper publishing process and kind of the internal politics of a big research organization was just not not for me. Yeah. Well, I'm new to this movement, but I have heard and read in my studies that you're not alone, that a lot of libertarians or, or center-right are kind of turned off from academia and mm -hmm. find a, a better home in the think tanks or, you know, the, the, the people that are shaping policy. Is that something that you found as well? well I, would, I don't know that it's unique to the center-right, but I think absolutely, you know, people go into academia because they care about the ideas. Mm. And then when you have a taste for the power of the think tank um, world, whether it's on the left or the right, or advocacy organizations like ATR or other uh, nonprofits in the space, you see the power of being able to implement change, mm. not just talking about ideas. I think that the action is the element that's missing from academia that you really get with the, with the think tank space in particular. How do these ideas matter for the world? Mm. I gotcha. That makes sense. That's the practicality of it. Yeah, that really captures your attention. Well, what about what you said? It was really fun to be in D.C. during the George W. Bush administration. What was what? What about it was really fun? I think just seeing the power of being able to make those ideas reality and seeing good policies being pursued, um, solid debates. You know, Paul Ryan, the Budget Committee at the time, was doing phenomenal work. Um, there was you know, the the discussions were in the right place. We were talking about. Um, privatizing, um, you know, everything from Social Security to, um, you know, having uh, HSAs and all sorts of different individual savings accounts um, really led by the private, uh, private sector and by individuals. It was a time when there was broad buy-in for a limited government. Nice. And how was your relationship with your family during that time, given that you're really in the world now? in this world now. Oh, they they understand that they will always raise eyebrows at, uh, at various things that I'm pursuing. That's just that baked in the cake now. <laughs> nice. That's good. Okay. Well, can you take me from that moment to where you are now with Philanthropy Roundtable? Sure, sure. Um, I guess briefly. So after ATR, I worked for another great mind, Dan Clifton, doing policy analysis for institutional investors. And this was a really wild time when we saw the fall of the Lehman Brothers, 2008 election of Obama, bailout of financial system, passage of huge stimulus packages, 
healthcare reform, financial reform, you name it, it was happening during this period. Um, so I learned a ton working for Dan at Strategus. And then I did some similar work at Bloomberg Government, helping again to translate what's happening in DC for a finance audience. And then uh, finally, I moved over to a trade association in 2012, where I spent a few, few years focusing mostly on Second Amendment issues. Um, but when COVID hit, I really was itching to get back into the broader liberty movement. And that's where I learned about the Flint Free Roundtable, which is a network of charitable givers from around the country that are united around a mission to promote philanthropic excellence, protect philanthropic freedom, and to advance the values of liberty, opportunity, and personal responsibility. So I was inspired, you know, hearing what the roundtable was doing to support the donors that were really giving back and to hear how the donors were coming together to make real change in our country and to support the causes and communities most in need. I think that during COVID, that was just a light bulb for me. So three years ago, I joined the roundtable as the director of policy research. I worked on issues like protecting donor privacy and keeping all the pathways to giving open. Um, and we have another research director now, the very talented Jack Salmon. Um, so right now I, I oversee the policy and government affairs team and uh, I work uh, with our crucial programs and services team as well that serves donors looking to effectively advance their own giving goals. So it's been it's been a fun three years at, at the round table. Marvelous. I'm glad to hear it. Can you point to any uh, story of these past few years where you saw a specific impact that really stuck with you? Sure. Yeah, that you know, that's a hard one because our, our overall goal is to protect philanthropic freedom in order to help encourage the generous charitable giving that supports all of the causes and communities that we care about. So it's really the donors and the charities that are making an impact. Um, but I will say we've had recent wins for philanthropic freedom on the government affairs side that will make a difference to that top line goal. Um, and one of these just this past year was the passage of a bill in Kansas called the Donor and Ted Protection Act. So often when a donor gives a major gift to an organization with a written agreement on how it's to be used, there's nothing they can do if that agreement is later violated. It's mm -hmm. a gift, not a contract. So you can't take a charity to court if your gift for a scholarship is later used for fundraising instead. Mm -hmm. So this bill changes that and provides legal recourse for uh, generous givers who want to make sure their intent is being honored. So when we talk about fostering more charitable giving, protecting donor intent is a huge way to make sure that Americans can be confident to give generously and know that their wishes will be respected. And I talk about coalitions a lot, but getting this law passed was no small feat. You know, our, our philanthropic excellence experts, jo Joanne Florino, the head of our state work, Megan Schmidt, they had countless education meetings with lawmakers, with nonprofits in the state, and with donors to help get this over the finish line. So certainly a win for the team to be proud of and one that will help us get more resources to those in need. I'm glad, I'm glad, congratulations on that. That seems, if I'm, I'm, I'm struck by how it came, that came to be a priority. Was this, how, how does it work at Philanthropy Roundtable? Are you, um, I'm guessing that you, you just heard stories maybe and people were like, hey, this is something that really bothered me about, you know, what happened and then you became a focus. How did that become a focus for you? Sure. Well, remember, we're a network of donors. So when our donors face obstacles to one of the pathways of giving or they see a challenge to some of the values that they align on, um, it's our role to look for solutions to that. So whether it's forced donor disclosure um, in a state or uh, violations to donor intent. Um, these are issues that restrict giving, that they they chill the ability for our donors to give back in ways that are meaningful to them. And we want to make sure we break down those barriers. And so donor intent is, is just the latest. We are also active in the states working to make sure there's not overregulation of the charitable sector, that there's not forced donor disclosure. So donors that want to give anonymously can do so. Um, and we really just want to make sure we keep keep giving free. That's the best way to get more of it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's wonderful. I'm glad that I'm learning more about, about this great organization. Can you tell me though, when you I listen to your story, I, I hear success after success. 
and just amazing and amazing accomplishments. Congratulations on that. What about a time where you had to overcome a challenge? Maybe not a failure, but a real challenge. How did you overcome it? Sure, sure. There have been plenty of failures, to be clear. Um, Challenge-wise, it's it's probably trite to bring this up, but starting at an organization and then hiring folks when everything was still remote, and, you know, during and after COVID is probably a major challenge for me. Um, overcoming this required really bringing everyone in uh, to DC to our headquarters on a regular basis, which our new president and CEO, Christy Herrera, is um, doing a great job of accelerating even farther. Um, this was really vital to make sure that we have a positive, collaborative, organizational culture. And I'd say the second approach to you know, getting over this challenge was, you know, we had a lot of contractors that did amazing things for the roundtable. I think, you know, top of mind is Christina Rasmussen, who is a great friend to SPN and just a huge strategic thinker within the movement. And she helped uh, build our Policy and Government Affairs team. Um, and then long term, in order to make sure we had an organizational culture, we've started bringing some of the contracting positions in house. So that was that was another way we've we've gotten more coalesced and and more of a cohesive organization, despite starting as a really remote shop. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot of th- a lot of the network is grappling with that. How do you have a strong? How do you have community when we're spread out right. so far? And that's. Uh... We all, I think the answer is different for every organization, but I'm glad that you're wrestling with it. I hope we can learn from that. And thank you for sharing it. Well, when you have a challenging day or a challenging month or week, what are some inspirations that keep you going? Well, the the best inspiration really is seeing how our donor community is helping those in need. Mm -hmm. Again, I know I've said this before, but the, the impact that individuals can make still inspires me. At the roundtable, we have an initiative called Values-Based Giving that helps bring donors together around the core values of liberty, opportunity, and personal responsibility. So there are groups like the Doe Fund and its willing, its ready, willing, and able program that helps tackle root causes of homelessness by providing year-long uh, programs for job training, education, sobriety support, um, or groups like Love Your School that help empower and support parents that are just trying to meet their kids' educational needs. You know, there's so many great organizations to draw that inspiration from. I'd say too, I mean, I think we saw the importance of charities and nonprofits in full light following the terrorist attacks in Israel on October 7th and the rise of anti-Semitism in our own country since then. And anyone who might've questioned the power of donors standing for what's right Shirley sees the incredible impact that donors have had in the higher education space in recent weeks, in particular when it comes to holding schools accountable and and really moving the needle. That's a really good point. Yeah. That's a a positive to take out of all of this terrible news. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, there's a lot to be inspired by. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Okay, well, speaking of people that we disagree with, like what we're talking about with uh, the terrible events that are happen that happen and are happening in Israel. Tell me about suppose how do you reach someone? Because you know, in this time where there's, it seems at least from most perspectives, a time of increasing polarization. How do you speak to people? Let's say that don't agree with you on the on opposite sides of the policy perspectives that you're pushing. This is a great question. I'll um, be sure to to forward the podcast along to Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. And, um, you know, the one thing I would tell him is that the reason we are seeking to protect what we call philanthropic freedom is to encourage and foster charitable giving to uplift and support causes and communities that we all value. You know, for those like Senator Whitehouse and, and many others that claim that our issues like protecting the privacy of donors that wish to give anonymously is really about shielding nefarious behavior, I'd say they're wrong. You know, at the end of the day, the reason we support the ability for donors to give how, when, and where they see fit, is about supporting everything from your local food bank to churches and synagogues and education and more of the resources people need getting to our communities. So I would just let them know 
generous Americans who want to give back are the real engine of doing good in our country, not the government. Yeah. And that's which I think they need to hear. Yeah, that makes sense. Where does that deep mistrust come from? I, I do a lot of social media mark, uh, monitoring for SPN. Mm -hmm. And so it's a daily thing that I hear exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. We're, we're, if we were going to try to get in the minds of people that hold these type of views, where does this mistrust come from? You know, I think some of it is this this rising populism that we're seeing. You know, we live in a time where it's very us versus them, where um, people who have resources to give to charities must have done something wrong to earn that um, that money in the marketplace. Um, they must have done it on the backs of those who don't have as much um, success in their in their financial life. And I think that you know culturally is is a huge challenge for us. And I think that's what's driving a lot of the distrust of institutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Institutional trust is eroding, it seems, every day. Yes. Well, that seems like a big challenge. But are there other challenges that you see as the biggest challenges facing our nation right now? Well, I, I live in Massachusetts and I work for an organization based in D.C. So there are plenty of local problems that uh, leave in the capable hands of our SPN partners in each place. Um, but again, I'd say the biggest challenge that we're facing really is cultural. You know, over the past years, this rising populist sentiment is it's understandable uh, in a lot of ways. But unfortunately, as we see it spiral into calls for more government control, it's really concerning. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we're used to seeing progressive progressives calling for a bigger government to crack down on the groups they don't agree with. But now we're hearing more and more of that from some on the right as well. And that's really concerning to me. You know, I, I talked about how energizing the limited government ideas were when I was a young professional in DC. And these ideas seem to be struggling more with our younger generations. And it's disturbing to hear folks on both sides of the aisle talk about how to use a muscular central government as a weapon to control Americans and to punish the other side, whatever that other side is. So, you know, I just say we, it's it's a big challenge and I do think it's cultural. And, you know, I, I'm heartened that I think the Flint to be round table and groups throughout the SPN network are really in a vital position to help push back on some of those populist us versus them mentality. Mm -hmm. um, that huge challenge. We have to meet it head on in the coming years. Mm -hmm. So you do think that that is it from the data you've looked at, is it more the younger generations that are more attracted to populism in, in your mind? In my mind, I would say yeah. anecdotally, I haven't yeah. looked deeply at the data on this. Okay. Many, many great groups have, but I've noticed just from my interactions with um, younger folks in the movement, it's yeah. interesting and, and concerning to see. And I hope that they grow into the uh, limited government free market uh, I, ideas that we've fought for, for, for several years now. So we'll see what happens, but I do anecdotally feel like it's coming a lot, uh, from the younger, younger folks in our movement. Okay. Yeah. Well, that is for me, I hear that as a, as a clarion call. It's let's start talking more to the younger folks. Absolutely. Nice. Okay, great. Well, on that note, what are some of the biggest goals that you have or hopes for your organization? Yeah, I have such big hopes for our organization in the future. You know, the the roundtable in general, it's been fortunate to have a series of really great leaders from Kim Dennis to John Walters to Adam Meyerson and Elise Westhoff to now Christy Herrera. Um, so I would just say, you know, I think in Christy, we have a new talented and principled leader that I know will stay true to the roundtable values. Um, at, at our past annual meeting, Christy captured some of what I share as hopes and goals for the organization by really focusing on the round table as a home for donors with shared values mm -hmm. and as a partner for protecting philanthropic freedom and helping donors protect their giving intent, as we talked about, and to help advance their philanthropic mission missions in really effective, useful ways. So with all the challenges like populism that America is facing, I'm hopeful that the round table will really help continue to support the generous individuals, effective organizations that are the best hope for us meeting those challenges of our time. Wonderful. Well, I'll be cheering you on and I'm so grateful. I just have one last question. Sure. Do you have anyone you can nominate for us to interview next here on Neighbors in the Network? 
Oh yeah, I have hundreds. Um, you know, there are a ton of great groups in the network. Uh, you might talk to Karen Lips of the Network of en uh, Enlightened Women. She has a new book out called You're Not Alone, The Conservative Woman's Guide to College, which mm -hmm. really speaks speaks to me. Mm -hmm. um, or Bill Jacobson doing great work at Legal Insurrection or Will Hill, that consumers research. You know, like I said, there are so many great groups on the ground that are doing the important work right now to strengthen our society. Love it. Okay. Well, thank you for these these uh, great stalwart people I can reach out to next. And yeah. thank you for spending so much time with us. I really appreciate getting to hear your story. And I think our listeners are going to be inspired just like me. So thank you so much, Elizabeth. I appreciate it, James. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. You too. Thanks for listening to Neighbors in the Network, an offering from the State Policy Network. We hope that this podcast can serve as a place for empathy, understanding, and human connection. Please let us know about your thoughts in the comments section. And thanks again.